the wind-driven fire is off and running. We, it's just to try to try to leapfrog and protect structures and life and property the best we can. These people were in real danger. We're, we're on our PA system in the vehicle. We can't get people out quick enough. And some people just aren't, aren't leaving. It was really, it was just insane. But it was hard to see the roads. Most of the roads were smoked over. And I could hear engine companies you know, talking about, hey, we're evacuating people on engines. We're, we're evacuating people by car. People are coming out. My name is Todd Leak. I am a battalion chief with Ventura County Fire Department. We did a lot of preparation that day. Um, our executive staff management um, over the years have put together an in-depth relationship with other, other partner agencies. And so I was actually working an extra day behind somebody that was either on vacation or had called in sick. And I was working in Battalion 5, which was in El Rio. We knew that we were going to have the winds blowing and it was, uh, you know, typical. For the, we've had the drought for the, over the last four or five years. So in preparation, um, there was extra strike team, which is five engines that came down from Cal Fire that had been staffed. So I was working there and the day had gone through and the evening was starting to come on. And, I, and they, during the plans that we go into for upstaffing for these kind of fire situations, uh, they gave us a driver and I had another captain, a guy named, a captain named Guy Horton, that was my driver that day. And so we get the alarm about 6.30 of a, of a brush fire out in uh, Santa Paula. An upgraded brush fire, 10,000 Santa Paula, Ojai Road, near Thomas Aquinas College. And um, en route, and I, you hear the radio traffic, and you know this is ramping up very quickly. I hear the battalion chief, who I assume was going to be first on scene, um, his car breaks down. So it was an aha moment right about then, um, thinking I'm going to come in and assist somebody, and now you're the, you're the first one there. And so I showed up and set up command in the, in the small park right on the outskirts of Santa Paula. And then um, our operations chief, chief uh, Dustin Gardner, he came in and took command and he um, appointed the um, operations chief, which, which is uh, Chad Cook, one of our assistant chiefs. He took operations and then we broke it down into branches with some other individuals. We had Gary Monday, John McNeil, and Fred Burris became the other branch. I came in, stepped in underneath Dustin. He appointed me as the uh, deputy IC and uh, we moved the command post to, from that park to station uh, 81 in Santa Paula. Operated out of there for a number of hours until I think it was after midnight. And then we eventually transitioned uh, late night, or early, I think it was early morning, the next morning by sunup or right around there, we transitioned to the fairgrounds. I had a, a engine company uh, officer on scene first. I heard on the radio that he already knew that this thing was gonna grow really, really fast. He already pre-ordered uh, five strike teams and a strike team is five engines, so I, it was my place to come in and take command, allow him get to work, and uh, then try to organize the chaos that was occurring. That's where the, the, the background, the preparation really comes in to know everybody's capabilities and the relationships with our partner agencies and with Cal Fire and, and Oxnard and Ventura and LA County and Santa Barbara. All those background um, relationships that are executive staff put together really came into play because those partner agencies came in and assisted us really, really quickly. And I, I got to hand it to our management team. Coordination with the Sheriff's Department, the Sheriff's OES, all the background training and relationships that goes in makes that kind of a situation really solidify. It's, you don't want to be there the first at, during the emergency with somebody you've never met before and didn't know what each other's game plan was. And they've really laid the groundwork to a successful operation. There's a process for ordering equipment. And when your neighbor's burning down and you're potentially losing homes or lives, it's nice to be able to navigate that system and make things happen a little bit faster. Not, not to circumvent it, but to help navigate and get the equipment fast. In that scenario, we have 60 mile an hour winds. It becomes a firestorm. And you really can't get ahead of it. We forecast it out. Um, afterwards, we are looking at the time frames and when we were at Station 81 and I was talking with uh, Chad Cook, our operations chief, who's actually out in the field and helping position equipment and, and giving direction to the branches and, and other um, equipment that's coming in. And so we're working with the sheriff's evacuation, evacuation. We're trying to stay ahead of that evacuation curve 
for lives and property. And we realized that at, a, at, at the time when it was left from Santa Paula to Ventura, it was eating, at one point, it was eating up almost an acre a second. And it's just, it's hard to fathom a football field being gobbled up every second. But when you have that ember cast, every time something catches on fire, it, catch, it goes and then blows another 60 miles an hour, it's, it's just gobbling up so fast. And so you can't get equipment necessarily out in front of it. I got hand, my hands off to all the, all the guys that are in the field um, to sit and listen to radio traffic and know that they were not only protecting structures and life and property, but they were actually at times not even putting out a fire, not even putting a hose on the ground. They're going up and making sure that the people are evacuated from their homes. And there's a lot of backstories that go with that. Of, and that I, it's be hard to capture all of them, but as you sit around the, and have uh, these uh, after action reviews with the guys in our, in our I battalion or the battalion chiefs that are doing it with the other guys, there are some very heroic stories. The guys have really did an excellent job, not only from our agency in our county, but guys that came in from outside partner agencies that really did some heroic things. It was pushing 30, 32 hours, um, but you get to the point where that's why we call in management teams to run these fires. It's not that we don't have expertise to do it for Ventura County Fire Department. We don't have the depth. We can't con contain and con uh, continue that pace for day after day after day. So we have to call in management teams that have the depth and let us pull back, get some rest, and then engage with that management team and um, not give them the fire. We don't turn over control, but we, we assist them and we, they come in and run the fire. When the team came in and transition command at the fairgrounds, then I went off and we were off for 12 hours or, or I don't think it was 24, but we were off for a good 12 hours and then came back. After the second or third day, I believe it was already bumping into, into Santa Barbara. I did go up on a strike team um, up there, take five engines up. And one of the days we were in where the palm tree farm is at on the, before you leave Ventura County, uh, I was taking a strike team up there and we were there that day when the fire blew th through that area. People ask the question often is, why wasn't there a fire engine at my house or why wasn't there one in my neighborhood? And when you do the math, we have, in Ventura County, we have 32 fire engines, excluding our reserves. Um, Ventura City has six, Oxnard has eight, but you can't uh, completely abandon a city for somebody who calls 911 and has a, a heart attack or um, a structure fire that happens at somebody's house or an auto accident. So it just takes a while to get equipment no matter how fast we ask for it, the travel time to come from LA or, or Santa Barbara or, or Kern, you just do, you know, just do the, the hours of driving and uh, they get there as fast as we, we can. Start with the two branches if you want to go clockwise. Initially in the Clearpoint on the Londo area, there's a lot more rescues being done than there was firefighting. And that's partly because there's the water issue and partly because people were not aware and one of the engine companies went to hook up to a hydrant and nothing came out. So they see the lights on the house, they go up and knock on the door and the people, elderly couple that was in the house, they didn't even know there was a fire. So they got them on the engine and, and um, transitioned and went back down out of the neighborhood. And some of the uh, footage from that was just a, just a wall of fire and embers that's blown across the street. You couldn't even hardly see where they were going. But it saved their lives. So there's a lot of stories like that I understand that the guys in the field really did above and beyond. We cannot force somebody to leave their house. We can say it's a mandatory evacuation. With that being said, they have to understand that once we leave, if they dial 911, there's really not gonna be anyone that's come to, to their rescue. We're telling them that now is the time to leave. And if you decide to stay in your residence, then you're taking your life in your own hands because it's either gonna be too risky for us to come back or we've maneuvered equipment knowing that that's a mandatory evacuation area, we're gonna move equipment to another area. And that and the last minute evacuations where they think they can stay, think they can stay, they can handle this, and all of a sudden they leave because all it takes, and it was, it was a shame that it occurred, was that the accident where the, the, uh, the, early, the lady lost her life in the accident in, in uh, Wheeler Canyon. You can't drive through smoke and know where you're going. Uh, you can't see other cars. Lots of times you can't see 10 feet. It's like drive, driving through Thule fog. You can't see. And then you start inserting the panic that comes over people from not ever being in that environment before. So it puts 
our firefighters at risk because if we're out pulling hose or we're out walking around a piece of equipment and all of a sudden some guy, some person comes and runs into a firefighter, runs into the apparatus, or they panic. It just creates an a situation where a street is now clogged where we could actually move fire apparatus and, and now we can't. I have to touch back on the support that came from all sides of the fire department. Um, our logistical support that was headed that evening by Larry Williams, uh, he runs our, a lot of our logistics stuff. I would make a phone call to Larry and he would, with to all of his uh, co-workers, would make things happen. There's an old saying in the military, if you don't have beans and bullets, the, the, the crew in the field is worthless. They can't, they can't perform. Well, our logistics staff, our, whether it's the the hose and the water and the food that kept the guys in the field and let them continue or the support from the repair unit at the end, the repair shop, the mechanics that are just, you know, kept the apparatus going. When things break down, they just got everything moving along. So I just got to say kudos to those. It took the entire fire department to make this happen and all the training and preparation. It was not just the line people. It was everybody that made it happen. I don't know if you heard about the stories of the copters and, and their difficulty. We had a copter from uh, Ventura County, uh, one of our aircraft, and it, it went to make a water drop and it got put, the wind was pushing it down so far they had to jettison their water and pull away. They tried to make it from Camarillo to Santa Paula, but the headwind was so strong they had to turn around, go across Ventura, come up Ventura Avenue, and then come across into Upper Ojai. And so, they, they couldn't do it, they couldn't make the water drops, and we knew at, at the ICP that we were having difficulties, we couldn't make it. So we figured, well, when the Blackhawks, the larger aircraft, they, I mean the helicopters from LA County, we figured they'd be able to make some drops, and they, they had the same problem. They had to jettison their water and, and return to LA. So when you have that strong a wind and downdrafts that put the copters and the crews at risk, then the wind-driven fire is off and running. We, it's just try to try to leapfrog and protect structures and life and property the best we can. Yeah, you throw every all the, a lot of times everything you prepare for you got to kind of throw it out the window when, when you get winds that that big, because you just don't know what's going to happen. You're reacting to what the fire is doing, what the what the weather is doing. You can have all the preparation, you can have all the key electronic iPads and computers and forecasts, and at the end of the day, it's good information to prepare and up staff for what could put, be the potential, but watch the potential hits, you gotta go back to your training and your relationships with other agencies to, to put the boots on the, on the ground and, and get the people out there to, to protect the citizens. I'm Michael Weisenberg, I work for Ventura County Fire Department. At the time of the Thomas Fire, I was on Battalion 2 uh, Alpha Shift, which is up in Ojai, so I was actually in the area that was affected. It was just one of those days you knew something was going to happen, you just didn't know what. You know, if you've done this this career for a while and when the weather is that significant and with the amount of fuels and how dry and hot, you just knew something was coming. So I was out shopping in Simi Valley and I came home to, I, I got the text that there was a fire. And in my mind, I've been through this before and I'm like, okay, we'll be doing this a week, no big deal. We'll get in, you know, I've got to go back, I got to go back to work. And so I get to Moore Park and from Moore Park, I hop, you know, I get in the shower. I was gonna take the family out to dinner and that did not, <laughs> didn't work out. My daughter goes, Dad, Dad, you gotta come see this. And we just live right in kind of a punch bowl where you can see Santa Paula in the distance. There's no other way to describe it except it look almost nuclear over there. And I had neighbors coming out. We, we were having calls into our uh, dispatch from people in Simi Valley who thought there was a large fire in Moore Park. That's how big it got that quick. And that was all within 20 minutes to a half an hour. So I proceeded, okay, I, I gotta get into work. I gotta cover, you know, and get back up into Ohio to my station. And I turned on my radio and I'm listening to the traffic. And I, like I said, I knew it's serious. You just knew just because everything was lining up. But we had uh, Chad Cook, who was, who was operations and, and truly one of the best operational people, probably, you know, in the business and cool, calm, but he was taking tactical pauses and regrouping. And when he started doing that and when the, the rate of how quick it was going, I knew this was big. So of course I get back up into Ojai, I get into service. I, I have a 
we call them drivers, but it's another captain or what have you who, who's the driver's assistant for a battalion chief when we have extreme conditions like this. Luckily, I had a very seasoned captain, Mark Fisher, excellent captain, and I kind of put it in his hands for a little bit because I went, we went and started driving down the, the uh, 33, and we wanted to see what's going on at Ventura, and before you knew it, it was here. And I, I mean, it was so incredible because you're listening to the radio traffic, you're trying to you're making the best decisions, the best tactical decisions. And, you know, the one thing that kept going through my mind, especially the first couple hours, was this is a fire that will kill firefighters. This is a fire that will kill civilians. People are honking to alert people who are still asleep. And my biggest concern and something that I was really focusing on is making sure that everybody was safe, getting people out of the way. I knew we were losing homes. You ask any firefighter, you, you know, nobody ever wants to lose someone's home. You just don't. But the biggest thing is we, we want to get everybody out. We need to get it because this, this just overwhelmed everybody too quick. On any given day, we have plenty of firefighters to take care of the calls. But when something like this happens, it just overwhelms so quickly. So I get down, we get down to Ventura and that's here and I was put in charge of evacuating the avenue in Ventura. I get a strike team in there, we're doing some structure protection, but we can't even get engines in there because we're clogged. Everybody's coming out. And the problem was, not everybody, but there was a good amount of people with their phones out in their cars. And I, I, I don't blame them because it's hard to if you, if you don't do this career and if you haven't seen what, what fires have been doing the last several years. And that's the fortunate thing about going up and down the state every summer fighting fires is that uh, you get to see the actual fire behavior. These people were in real danger. We're, we're on our PA system in the vehicle. We can't get people out quick enough. And some people just aren't, aren't leaving. And we're trying to put engines in. We're trying to protect people. It was really, it was just insane. We obviously, you know, there's a point where you can't send people in. You know, there just isn't. They, they wouldn't survive. But we, we get ahead of the fire when we can. And yeah, I wish the public would know this is that if you know if, if you get out voluntarily, that allows us to get in and protect your. Once you stay, then we got to get you out, and we can't protect your property at the same time. Because it was all over the place, it really was. Is okay. If I put my people in here, do they have escape routes? Do they have uh, shel you know temporary shelter in case something blows through? So I go out and scout ahead of them before I put them in. And that's, I'd go up into, and I formed into a structure group. We met down at the Vons down there on, uh, you know, on the, uh, on the Avenue and Main. And I was assigned three strike teams, I believe, from, from uh, the first one was ironically from Arcadia, Alhambra, and Pasadena, where I grew up. I also had two strike teams from Orange County. And so I'm following and we're, we got assigned to go up to Adelanto and we got to about Hall Canyon and there's just, there's homes on fire and I just decided, I go, we're not going any further, we got to make a stance here. This is where we're going. And now there's, I mean, there's homes going, it's surreal. There's alarms going from cars that are burning, there's, home, you know, house alarms going. We're trying to see if there's any people there. It was just, it was, it was insane. You know, I, I talk about this in uh, CERT classes, the community emergency response training that I teach. And it's, you know, you do the most good uh, for the most amount of people, right? So I need to put these people in here. Now, now you gotta remember the people that I'm putting in here are from Orange County, are from San Gabriel Valley. They've never been in Hall Canyon before. It's late, it's dark. Literally everything is on, on fire around you. And they really did an awesome job. The crews that came in, you know, they took direction. I was able to scout it out. We were given direction to another uh, strike team leader. And I was the structure group in that area. So I was, you know, I had several strike teams and we didn't realize it, but uh, wires had fallen down on our Suburban. That's just how insane everything was. And the firefight that took place for the next several hours was, it really was, they say epic, I don't, you know, but it was. You know, I try to be personable and when, when things like this pop up, you know, you, you want to make a connection with someone because you're, you're fighting fire. I mean, this is the real deal. This is what we train for. And this is not a structure fire. These are multiple, these are blocks that are on fire. 
some of the things yeah. with the firefighters, not just from Ventura County, but from all our, our agencies in the area, let alone people from you know Orange County, LA County, San Gabriel Valley, Santa Barbara County, all over. And that's kind of a testament to our fire chief, the relationships he's built because they were phone calls. We got people here within a several hours, you know, within a few hours, and that just doesn't happen. There was just people just pouring in. And you know, the mutual aid response we have in California is the best in the country. It is truly the model for the country, but typically not as good as what happened that night. The one thing that hampered is, you know, when daybreak, usually we call this initial attack. Usually initial attack happens for 12 hours, maybe a little bit longer. I mean, we had initial attack for probably five days. It was not stopping. And the fires in the morning, everybody always thinks, okay, hey, the fires are gonna die down. These fires weren't dying down. We all knew this. Now the problem started happening where people were coming back. We had wires down. We still had homes burning. I mean, it was not truly unsafe. And the best intentions, you know, the civilians were, oh, I'll be okay, I'll be okay. So now that put another strain on our resources and, you know, problems with water. We were unable to get water at certain times. Uh, but we just had to make do. So we did shuttle operations and we got water tenders and we got people down and we just made do. But the biggest thing I think was when we didn't hurt or kill anybody that night, I considered that a success. Now I never wanted to see the homes um, that burnt down that did, but the people that were assigned to me saved blocks. And I, I just want to throw back really quick to Captain Fisher, who was up at Station 23. They went down to the Nordic track in Ventura. They were the only one assigned there. They literally probably saved the Nordic track. They had fire, and this is with five firefighters only. They had, you know, a couple houses started going. They put hose lines on each side and they battled it for several hours. And they literally, by themselves, with no one else, like I said, I don't want to over exaggerate, but once I went back ago, they probably saved the whole, the whole track. And there's stories of, you know, that just, you know, I was really truly proud to be a Ventura County firefighter. My assignment was uh, public information. They wanted me to help with uh, getting the word out for the evacuations. That was kind of the big thing was getting information out on where the fire was and, and where the evacuations were gonna be. So we were working with the Sheriff's Department and um, OES. I, I followed the fire down into Ventura. So I drove Foothill Road, uh, got into Ventura, and I kind of followed it there. And you could hear the operations chief, uh, Chad Cook, you could hear him talking about, hey, I want to clear point and I want to start evacuating these areas, uh, which I think a, a lot of us, it kind of shocked us at first. Like, that's a big chunk of dirt that you're talking about evacuating, you know, and but I, that's where it was. I mean, that's, that's where it went. And I've kind of bounced around different areas trying to figure out if I could be of help anywhere else. Uh, but it was hard to see the roads. Most of the roads were smoked over. And I could hear engine companies you know, talking about, hey, we're evacuating people on engines. We're evacuating people by car. People are coming out. Uh, and I could hear this, and it's funny, I was sitting in, I'm in a Prius, you know, small, very small economy car with no markings on it except on the doors. So everywhere I went, I, I had to kind of break through roadblocks and the law enforcement officers would give me a dirty look at first and I have to turn the wheel so they could see the side and they go, okay, go ahead. Uh, it was just, it wasn't the perfect car to be in. So, uh, but anyways, I went into Ventura City and as I got in there, it was, I mean, it was smoked out. I got into basically uh, into downtown off of Poli and it was smoked out, which then I realized that my daughter lived there. <laughs> so I called her up, I go, hey, you evacuated, right? And she goes, yeah, I, I'm at your house. I go, cool, all right, good. And it just so happens that her fiance is a uh, EMS supervisor. And I had just seen him, just talked to him at the command post because he was on duty as, that night as well. And so I had an Africa to ask him if they'd evacuated. So she told me she'd taken like the important documents, but she didn't, didn't take anything out. And it's funny, I remember her asking, do you think I should go back and get clothes and other things? And part of me is like, you don't want to come down here right now anyways, I can hardly see. And she was in the Hawaiian uh, village, I'm like, I'm like, yeah, you're in an apartment building in the middle of town. I think, I think you're going to be okay. I think I can go. And either way, you can't come back now anyways. So I drove there, and that's a, somewhere in that time. It, between then and driving the avenue, which was just chaos on the avenue, trying to evacuate people with a limited road system over there, going back and forth, 
uh, is when then I got back into downtown Ventura. And it's funny because everything's kind of a blur. The time, you look at your watch and you realize that, you know, sometimes it felt like a minute took hours. And other times you look, you're like, oh my gosh, it's 10 o'clock, you know? You could hear the Clear Point Adelanto area that's burning. Uh, and then as I'm driving to Ventura, there's a big kind of yellow house that was on top of the hill that I've seen. I've seen it many times and it's just completely on fire. There's no apparatus, uh, no fire engines around. I mean, they're tapped out. In fact, I ended up meeting up with one of the chiefs that was in charge of that area. And, and he's just, he's sending resources, you know, to do the most good uh, type thing because it was just, I mean, it was a huge fire front that came in there. It was, yeah, it was, I mean, there's a lot of fire and a lot of smoke and people everywhere. Although the numbers say that 27,000 people evacuated that first night, that's unheard of to get that many people to move. A lot of the people that I talked to said they moved, they, they left, at least in that area, because of the fires in October in Santa Rosa, which a lot of us were on. And they, they remember the people died there and they thought, you know what, I don't want to get caught. and uh, I'm getting out, which thankfully, it made our job easier, a lot less people to worry about. We've never had a fire like this in, in, in Ventura County. We pride ourselves on, on keeping them small. We pride ourselves in being good at structure protection, uh, but it was different, you know, I and mean, we saw this in October, and so this was a different experience. And then we've had larger fires, but we haven't had structures burn like that. And so there isn't anybody that's on the department or in this community, I mean, everywhere you went, I don't know, there's like 10 people I know, between people in our fiscal department and our firefighters and family. And then you can walk somebody somewhere, you can be in Simi Valley and talking to somebody and find out they lost their house or their mom lost their house. Or It's amazing, it's a large county, but a small community.